I want to start at the beginning, man. Um, you moved from Ohio, right, to Los Angeles? Yeah, 1985. Damn, explain, ex Ohio. explain that. Oh, no, nothing. It's just a move, life change. You know, my mom she went back to college in the late seventies. So when she graduated, we either to move to Atlanta or to LA. And she had a, one of her best friends lived here. She told her about all the opportunities. We didn't have a clue. And you know, when you grow up in cold weather states, your dream is to go somewhere warm. <laughs> so, you know, on the plane we went and, and ended up in LA. Okay, okay. Now, I mean, was it? A, it had to be a culture shock, right? I mean, some sort of. Like, damn. Oh, complete, completely, because, you know, when you, like I said, back in them days, you know, it wasn't on like YouTube and all that type of stuff. So we grew up watching California, and we knew Sunshine, uh, the Jacksons lived there, um, <laughs> palm trees, the beach, you know, people in roller skating and, and uh, bikinis and all that type of stuff. So when we got off the plane and ended up in Inglewood, I was like, well, what is this? This don't look nothing like <laughs> what I saw on TV growing up, you know. I had never seen like a, a Mexican before, you know. No Ohio shit. was very, very, very black and white back then. You know, we had a couple Puerto Ricans and stuff. So I saw these little brown people. I was like, well, what are those? And my neighbor was like, those are Mexicans. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, Mexican. <laughs> All right. You know what I mean? So the culture shock, it went from that to, um, you know, arriving in the middle of L.A. street culture with, you know, hustling and mm -hmm. gang banging. I didn't know nothing about that. And. People had to tell me, you know, what to say if somebody approached you and all that. And I was like, they approach you? Like, yeah, they're going to ask you what that you from and all that. I was like, oh, man, I'm about to die. <laughs> <laughs> like, it is crazy. I just came from a town where I had just like a paper route and, you know, shit like that. You know, very nice and, and, and uh, tame, suburban life to the mean streets of L.A. And it, it, it taught me many, many valuable lessons. Mm -hmm. Damn. And you, went to, you moved to Inglewood, right? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Did you ever get affiliated with with any gangs or? No, no. I'm okay, not, yeah, no, you didn't. You know, you know, you know it, I don't think you come to town and join the gang. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have any. You know, I didn't have any male relatives or, or family members out here. And, you know, the kind of friends I had back then. Most of my friends had like private school dudes. It just happened to be where I stayed. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. we we knew people that were hard heads or whatever, but they kind of knew we were just like regular guys. We weren't into that type of stuff. Anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and my friends that are from that, you know, they never allowed me to even get close to it. And, you know, it's like, man, I need to make some bread. It's like, nigga, we'll give you some money. You ain't going to be out here doing this. You got other mm -hmm. things to do. So that protected me a lot. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just, I, 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 I understand it, but I don't, I don't come from that type of street life to where I knew really, you know, how to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You know. Yeah, good. Yeah, you never struck me as that guy. Um, who did you grow up listening to? Whoever was out. You know, the, those those are the, the treats of uh, hip hop back in the day because it wasn't three hundred thousand people mm -hmm. making records. You know, I, I listened to the mainstays um, from you know the first time I heard um, like uh, you know we all heard Sugar Hill Gang yep. and. And being in Ohio, sometimes on the weekends we could pick up pick up some of the mixed shows, like from Buffalo, New York, wherever stuff was coming from, you know, New York City. You know, some of the stations picked it up. Sometimes we could get on the radio and hear the real mixing and the real DJs and stuff. But Cleveland was pretty good with keeping everybody abreast of, um, you know, everything. You know, Bat Boys, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Run, Boogie Boys, LL, EDP, uh, Just Dice. Um, anything really, yeah. you know, my friends, my friends, you know, we, 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 we were uh, heavily into break dancing. So anything from beat street to, to break in to, you know, everything that was on Tommy boy back in the day, we always had that, you know, planet, planet rock and, you know, Africa band butter, what's on the force, you know, everything that made you move. Cause we wanted to embrace it. It wasn't like we were just stuck on one type of thing. Cause all hip hop, we embrace so you know from hearing you know Curtis Blow, and I, I really used to dig Christmas rapping his song, mm -hmm. and um, you know we 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 put our little chains together and we go buy twelve inches. You know Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. We never thought about actually ever pressing up a record. We didn't know nothing about studios. We didn't have no equipment. You know I think I bought like a realistic microphone from um, Radio Shack. Radio Shack. Yeah, we used to record ourselves. 
we would do a beatbox track and then play the beatbox track back and rap to it and stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is just real, real homegrown. And it, it wasn't until I moved to L.A. and I met people that had, you know, DJ equipment or somebody had a drum machine and all that stuff. And it was like, that was amazing to me. Because, you know, be, being an uh, entertainment city, Bay City, you know, you meet a dude in the regular neighborhood who got a full setup in his bedroom. I'm like, damn, mm-hmm. you got all this right there. You know, yeah. my mom bought it for me. I take it seriously. So you meet up with people like that, and you go over there and try to cut little songs on the four track and all that. And I, and it turned into uh, me meeting Greedy Greg through my DJ, Mo Doe, rest in peace, one of my best friends. And, um, his boy June, DJ Cole Cash, they took me over to Greg's house to make a, um, you know, a little four track demo. We tried to pound out a beat or two mm-hmm. on the drum machine, and Greg recorded me, and I sounded horrible. I still had a tape too. I sounded, I sounded like a, a, a crazy person. I sounded like a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, he, you know, he had kids coming through making demos all the time, so he didn't pay me no mind or whatever. But over over a couple of years time, I started spending more time learning how to produce, jumping on the machines. You know, he would just give me an 808. Don't break it. You know, give me, give me a lens drum. Don't fuck it up. You know, I take it to school, making beats at lunchtime and all that shit. So that helped me get into the groove of making records. And by, by the time I was like 16, 17, me and a couple of my friends, we were seriously working on, investing on getting our own 12-inch printed up. Mm. At the same company where Easy and everybody started, because that was the go-to spot at Macola, right? Macola, yeah. You can go press up a thousand, you know, thousand or five hundred uh, twelve inches for a couple grand. So that was one of my first starts. We- In many ways, Macola functioned like a uh, a record label on the West Coast by signing deals with minor record labels to press and uh, assist with the distribution of artists' records. Macola fascinates me. Um, Tell us a little bit about McCullough and what you remember about those days. Uh, I think that's where you could you could get your, uh, you know, you can you can start your. And, it, and, it, and I don't even think people looked at it as a career. Mm-hmm. It was it was more of like this is what's going on, you know, the dance crews, rap crews, and you know, we ciphered up every day at school that everybody's dream was to have a on twelve years, whether you sold them or not. You know, just to show to show people you made a record and possibly get it on K-Day. AM Stereo, K-D-A-Y. And i like to thank all the stations in L.A. to play rap. All one of you. And that's what the main thing was, was getting your stuff on K-Day. You know, we had the first 24-hour radio station. And when I first moved to L.A., it just blew my mind that I could listen to rap 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. You know, back, back east, we had weekend mix shows and stuff. We never had it where they just played it all day. They were shut down probably about eight to twelve to play slow jams, but back you know back at it at one. So that 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 brought everybody together. We always heard all the local artists, you know, Master Master Spade, King T, Ice T, um, God the Battle Round, you know, all those great songs. JJ Fad, you know. So you wanted to be a part of that that thing going down because you knew that meant something, you know. Yeah. Tell this uh this YouTube generation um, how hard it was, and, and not only that, but how expensive it was just to press up, say, a 12-inch. I tell them all the time. You know, they didn't have to buy uh, two-inch tape reels to go into the studio. You know, it's like you open up your computer with a, a $100 program, and you can cut world-class quality records, mm-hmm. you know. So back in the day, you had to get the tape. You had to get the two-inch reel and the other reels if you mix them down. Um, you had to get studio time, which wasn't cheap, especially in Hollywood. You know, all the studios I first started at were in Hollywood. You talking about thousand dollars a day? Damn. You know, you know, you get a you get an eight hour block. You get that's about a G. Mm. So uh, luckily, I had a friend. Now the funny thing, what I used to do, I was so geeked on the concept of trying to be in this business that I would I would talk to the guy. I don't know if his name was Jim or something like that. I still got the number of McCullough. And I would, I would, after school, I would call him and talk to him about, you know, yeah, I'm almost ready to bring my record in. Yeah, just bring it in and we'll, we'll take care of you and we'll press it up and all that stuff. And we'll give you a good price and all that. And a friend of mine in high school, dude named Dooney, Ernest, he, um, his uncle was Wayne Henderson from the Crusaders. Mm. So he knew I was making little four-track demos, me and my boys. 
And he was like, yeah, man, my uncle's looking for rappers, right? So I said, okay, wh- wh- what I got to do? He's like, just call him, right? So I called, I called him from November to May. I'm like, every day I made sure I had, I called him right after school, hit the pay phone, call him, and he, he dodged me for months. And mm-hmm. when early May, early May, next the year after, he finally took my call. He said, man, God damn, man, you've been calling here for months. I guess I need to give you some studio time. I was like, yeah. So he booked me for a Saturday. I came in and started working on my three-song demo. And from then on, I was working in a real studio. You know, like Ice Tees, you record their prints, all kind of artists and stuff. So it was cool being in that 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 element, really, of being in a professional recording studio, working the board, learning the equipment, learning how to arrange, you know, put together songs, scratch choruses and everything for you know, the songs we were working on. Mm-hmm. Never came out of that like that, but that was a hell of an experience, you know, getting to work there for a couple of years. And then uh, I went back and started working with Greg because he had had some other groups. So around that time, my songs started getting stronger, started getting better. I started developing a persona, which would be AMG. Because before that, I was more like just a, not, not really realistically a battle rapper, but more of just a tour, you know, like a, you know, want to be rocking Big Betty Kane type of style of rap. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, while I was working on some songs, because I always had the mind to make a bunch of nasty shit. You know, we take people records and fuck them up and twist the words around and, yeah. you know, make them sexual or whatever. So I decided, like, maybe I need to go with this angle. And they used to argue me down, you know, the older dudes. They'd be like, man, he, he ain't going to be on the radio with that and all that. I was like, I don't give a fuck about the radio. I just want to make a killer-ass song. You know what I mean? Make these are the kind of records I want to make. Because it, 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 uh, it tickled the shit out of me, the reaction I would get off the songs I would make. And people would be like, oh, my God, you know. So from then, so you're talking about probably like 89 to 90. Doing that and around that time, the, the guys that eventually helped us get our deals, which was uh, Tracy Kendrick and Courtney Branch, they had a company called Total Track Productions. Mm. They were working on a demo for a singer. A girl name was Claudia, and the guy that was producing the demo was DJ Quick. We, so you're talking about probably like 89 to 90. Doing that, and around that time, the, the guys that eventually helped us get our deals, which was uh, Tracy Kendrick and Courtney Branch. They had a company called Total Track Productions. Mm. They were working on a demo for a singer. A girl name was Claudia, and the guy that was producing the demo was DJ Quick. Mm. And um, they had called Greg and was like, hey, man, you got this kid over here. He's got some pretty good songs on his own. Now, Quick was in Penthouse Players. Okay. So he was already recording his own solo stuff, and I don't know if he was just going to do something else after they broke out, you know, after they came up and all that type of stuff, you know, just up to his own thing. So what what happened then was that Quick eventually left Penthouse and he came over to uh, Greg's and we started uh, pounding out stuff, pounding out some records. And the first record, Greg got some investment money to do a 12-inch on me and Quick. We used to have different names because he was still quick, like Pussy on one side, and that's how I ended up... Uh, Saying ain't nothing like Black Pussy on my dick, works for the motherfucking DJ Quick. Because quick. Cause Bitch Got My Money was going to be the B-side, and then we had a song together, which was Tear It Off, which went on his first album. But that was going to be our 12-inch to help us get into the business, mm-hmm. you know. Because we we, we kind of, I wanted to make dirty records. He, you know, Quick is more, you know, tonight, he got more commercial-friendly type shit, mm-hmm. even though he did, like, the street stuff and stuff like yeah. that. So after that didn't work, um, you know, he brought it over second. And then High C eventually, and we all just started gelling and jamming together and helping each other work on songs for our projects and stuff. And we ended up making a uh, a mixtape, hmm. which broke out nationwide and it eventually got into the hands of some important people. And, you know, at the same time, Total Track was shopping deals, so they were shopping the records. And um, Profile picked up on Quick's record. And that was our intro into the official record business for the record with an album. Hmm. Mm. And you signed with Select, right? But for a single deal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, here's the thing. Profile wanted me. Select wanted Quick. Corey and Profile outbid uh, Fred's mail at Select like about another 25000 or whatever. His budget was no big budget back then, like 100, 100 bucks and a quarter. So, and 
Plus Quick had the more of a, she had a whole album done. I was probably like five to six songs deep. So the thing was to do was to do his album first. And I said, I'll take the single deal. So at least I have something out during the same time. Yeah. Okay. You want, you didn't, you didn't want to miss the wave because if, you know, I, we knew the record was going to do good. We just didn't know it was going to be that good. You know, we was just trying to make, make a couple bucks. We was like, man, if we can get a car, <laughs> or we can, you know, make like twenty, thirty thousand dollars We had no idea gold and platinum records was coming and all that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, now you're, the type of music you guys were uh, were making was getting a lot of bad media exposure from the likes of C. Dolores Tucker and, and broads like her. Um, did you personally have any issues with censorship? Personally, no. Okay. No you, protests you are, you are, or anything? Well, you know, you know, you got you got to remember, Luke had already was doing his fight with it, and WA yeah. and sold five five million records. So they were we, we we were on the radar, but it wasn't nothing like it was totally different. Hmm. You know what I mean? And and you know to to combat that, you know, they had the stickers, coronavirus, advisory, so the stickers back. I mean, on the albums back in the day. So it is, it was what it was, and those type of things they actually made the record sell more. Hmm. You know, people were just interested. Well, what is this guy saying? Well, you know, what are they talking about? You know. Mm. Now, now let me ask you, because um, you've fe- been featured on a on a few people's songs. You've done collab records with people, and we're going to get into that. But um, nowadays, you can do a feature, and the guy, the other guy's in China, and you're in Los Angeles. Um, back in the day, when you did a feature with somebody, did you have to be in the same studio, or uh, did they ship you the track? Yeah. How did that work? No, no, none of that. No. No, no, not at all. Okay. And my my thing about feature, you know, it's it, it's it, it seems like everything is really really watered down because technology made everything so easy. Mm-hmm. And even with features and collaboration and stuff, it's like I try to tell artists don't do records with people that you don't even have a you know real feel for. You know what I mean? Like like you you know you're not really connected to because it it. it it, it don't make sense mm-hmm. at the end of the day to, to me, mm-hmm. you know, you know, it, it, it is what it is. You know, this, this, this music business is fueled on, you know, um, you know, something exciting, you know? So, so yeah. And then, and then it, it came, it became an era probably, I don't, I don't know if it was like the kid or late nineties or early two thousands, you'd have a whole album and it had 20 other people on it. Oh man, Jesus, seriously. You, you know what I mean? Like every song had this guy on it. And then yeah. the next song had this guy. It's like, man, he's like, well, how you going to do the song in public? Because that, that nigga ain't going to be there. You know what I mean? Or, or you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you know, when you're looking at artistry, it's like, man, I want him to like me first. Like, I get it. I can do a song with this person or that person, but it just has to make sense. Yeah. And that's what I mean. Just like, you know, that's like me coming out right now. Like, oh, yeah, I got, I got Cardi B on my shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, fly me a verse and shit. Like, you know, it's like, I don't even know this motherfucker. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. from my standpoint, because, you know, those those are the type of things that, that that were done because they had to be done that way. You, back in the days, artists, I mean, companies didn't even want you featured on other people's records. Mm. You know, not at all. No, they they uh, had they had issues with all that. It's like, why would you go over there and make them money? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, but then, you know, the industry got weak and everybody was just trying to pull out all the tricks and all the stuff. So, well, what if we can get so-and-so on there? What if we can do, you know, all that type of stuff. Yeah. It's like a desperation thing. You know, the collaborations that make sense, you know, like you think about great co- collaborations, like a, a Notorious Big and Jay-Z record. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the niggas knew each other. And they was, you know, they was on the same level lyrically, and they were both, you know, devastating on the mic. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. And that's why you and Quick gelled so, so easily. Well, we, we, no, it's not, we made records together. We came yeah. up together. Yeah. You know, so it's not, it's not like, it was some fake shit where I, I met him and then it was like, hey man, let's do a song. You know, nigga, we came up doing demos together. <laughs> we- Tell us about working on, on the Zebrahead soundtrack. Uh, Zebrahead came in. That was my first uh, soundtrack. And uh, I I didn't know what to, because we didn't really know what the hell the movie was about. Mm-hmm. So he was like, we'll just, we'll just do a cool record and, and throw it on here. And, be, and it was actually one of the more favorite records, I guess, from people on the soundtrack, because I didn't, I didn't have a clue. Cause the record, I don't think the movie did too big, but it became like a little cult yeah, type of movie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. 
So it, it was exciting for me to even be a part of that. Like you go to the movie and you hear your song in the movie. Mm-hmm. That, that shit's amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so that, that's and I put my boy on there. Uh, huh? Go No, go ahead. You put who on there? No, I put my boy uh, P.B. Flexer. I gave him his first little break on there. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah. From what I read, do you, do you know or is this true that MC Search has something to do with that? Because he was apparently the one that, that was in charge of that soundtrack. And well, sir, yeah, search, search did the uh, soundtrack. Mm-hmm. He probably did. Yeah. He probably, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he did because we, we Def Jam affiliated and stuff like that. So, um, what it was is he heard, I know, you, he I heard know you on a song search. with, sorry, he heard you on a song with Boss in, from well, Detroit. He heard, the song, he heard my song with Boss yeah. on it. Yeah, there you go. There you Cause, go. Because my, my sister's a bitch is the record that got her signed at Def Jam. Uh, no shit. Yeah, oh, that okay. shit ain't no accident. Oh, yeah, I broke her in 1991. Boss, man. Damn, I missed that. I, I always wondered what happened to her. But you, you were saying you knew Search from, from where? No, I'm just saying through, you know, the hip-hop shit. You okay. know, you get con- conventions or whatever, whatnot. But if he heard her, if he heard, if he heard me and her on uh, My Sister's a Bitch, that might have been the reason, too. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's how the story But I remember not Nas on that record. Um, Nas is on, Nas is on that record for sure. Uh, L- Large Professor. Oh, no, that's, yeah, yeah that's a, there's a few people on there. Yeah, and I and I had met Nas. We was doing, uh, we did uh, a, a radio show from a guy named Lee Bailey. Lee Bailey had a radio show called Radio Stoke, uh-huh. and then we interview all the stars and stuff. And, you know, that was the thing to listen to. On, like, I think it came on, like, Sundays or on the weekends. And um, I uh, did an interview with Nas. You know, Nas was just coming out. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's when I met him back in the day. I'd offer to take him to Roscoe's and hang out. The New York dudes was kind of leery back then. He's like, yeah. oh, I'm good, man. You know what I'm saying? They didn't want to <laughs> hang out. They thought it was all gang banging and crazy. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, so you were, on, you were on Quick's first tour. Tell us what that was like. Oh, it was it was amazing. Um, so you, you gotta remember, like I said, we we didn't know what to expect from the record shit. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, Quick is the name. I remember shooting the Born and Raised in Compton video. Mm-hmm. Uh, Quick is the name. Album came out like January '91. By March '91, it was certified gold. So a month later, they said, uh, "You guys are going on a, on a tour with EPMD and all." He was like, "What? Damn, right." So I think the end of April, early May, we went off on like a, I don't know, it was 30 city tour, 40 city tour. We hit a, hit a lot of towns. And it started in, um, I think, Baltimore, Maryland. And um, I think the first night, I still it's, it's still a blur because I, it, it was just something about being on the road. You know, we drove from California all the way up to Maryland, had a tour bus and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And we were just excited to be there, man. You know, we got to meet people we grew up listening to and yeah. fans of and all that shit. By the, by the third or fourth show, because we started going down south, and that's where Quick sold a lot of records, Midwest and all that shit. Mm-hmm. By the third show, you know, we was an opening act at first. So, you know, we was like second opening act or whatever. Mm-hmm. Man, by the third or fourth show, that's like, Hey man, y'all go going right before EPMG come on. Nice. Because a lot the people was coming and they seen us and you know, Quig and us and after they seen us they left. The crowds was leaving. So they start putting us on later. They put us on later, right before the headline. So that shit went really quick because it was Gangstar, which was amazing. Damn. Them dudes got love for them to this day, oh. Premier, you know, Keith. You know, we had big fun. Um EPMD now, EPMD had uh, an important gentleman named Craig Mack, rest in peace. Craig Mack was one of their roadies. Okay. And we used to, and Craig, we used to freestyle and do all kind of shit. He was fun. Uh, Red Man was around before, you know, before the record deals. You know, it was a whole part of their crew, and I got to see the inner workers of a, a real rap crew and, and, and doing their business. And Eric and Paris, they took me under their wing. I'd be hanging out with them dudes in their room all the time and just, Listening to them, because they, they were kind of co-sponsoring the tour, too. So I was watching the business, seeing how they did that. You know, how they operated. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Father MC, Chubb Rock. Um, and I think I think Mary J. Blige was on the road with us also singing, um, you know, Father's Record, If You Do For Me, I'll Do For You. Yeah, yeah because we was like, who's the girl? And she had, like, uh, the people with her names keeping her away from everybody. I was like, oh, that. And when she came out, I was like, man, that was the girl that was on the road with us. 
But they, you know, she. I guess she was signed to Uptown, and they wouldn't let nobody bother her because she's about to blow up and be a big star. Uh, but yeah, that was that was a hell of a tour, man. Damn. And we did the whole country. Ooh. We did the whole country, man. And, and I'm talking about twenty thousand, ten thousand seaters, twenty thousand seaters, and that shit was just crazy. Damn. How, energe yeah. how energetic was the room when that bass line started? Doom. It ain't nothing like black pussy on my dick. Let me tell you. To the Let me tell you. DJ. Go ahead. The record, the record picked up. Like, like when we went, when uh, the single for Bitch Real How Money came out like in March 91. So by the time Quick's album went go, my single was coming out. So when we went on the road, I got to do that song in front of everybody. And, you know, the inner cities, they knew it and it was working. But that whole tour thing we did for two months, that helped fuel that and sell that shit like uh, it was nothing. Okay. So when we came, we came back off the road, like in like July, you know, I said, all right, I'm not going to go back on the next leg. I got to, I got to, uh, you know, get my album budget and uh, cut my album because I wanted to come out that year. See, second to none in between January and like March, <clears throat> they cut their album already. Mm. So while we were on the road, we was listening to their album the whole time. Quick's album was done and sold and selling. Their album was finished. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my album finished. So I went out on the first leg for two months. I came back. I said, y'all going without me. I'm going to stay here and cut my album so I can have my stuff out this year. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Damn. Now, um, we're talking the late 80s, early 90s, more, more No, more, early 90s. Early yeah. 90s. So we're talking the early 90s where, I mean, gangbanging was popping i mean it was hot as fucking fish grease um w did you guys have any issues you know being affiliated not saying you were but you know quick being affiliated no, no, with blood but I, I was yeah they had all kinds of problems because we would be in different states where we didn't know they had crips yeah and and they would be all in the front row and fuck you nick fuck you slob ass nigga fuck you quick fuck y'all niggas and, you know Damn. you niggas out of town flamed up and all that shit we was all you know my, my thing was all right well as long as we're protected, you know, because, you know, on stage, it's the image of it. It's like if you talk to somebody face to face, y'all might be able to resolve shit. Like we, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of things like that happen. And even at home, like, you know, I remember I had to take a position of, you know, those are my guys and we do what we do. And they're, they're from where they're from and y'all know what they are. But I'm not a part of that, even though these still my guys. So... Mm -hmm. I was I was trying to you know especially I live in Los Angeles so I have to have the freedom to move around without getting dealt with you know what I mean yeah. and, and you know <clears throat> I, I I got protected you know because uh, they kind of could tell like man this nigga he ain't even from here he ain't with all that shit it's like yeah man it's like they from that and they and they let y'all know that but they ain't not tripping either you know what I mean yeah. so it was kind of hard to have that young success and fame. And maneuver because I was a club head. I, you know, I'd always, I was always in front of clubs, partying even before I had records out. So I didn't want that to stop. You know, just my life. You know, just yeah. being a young guy out the street, twenty, twenty-one years old. Yeah, you could be at the club and all that shit. So you know, and you know, we we got a certain um, amount of uh, love for just um, basically just you know being easy about all kind of shit like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, we wasn't rolling out with. 400 people and all that type of stuff but they didn't they didn't go out too much anyway you know okay. i used to ask them was like y'all don't go out and i know we don't go out through all that shit but they they grew up there you know what i mean so they know what it really is like i don't i'm naive i don't know nothing about i was like i was over here and so and so and so hey man them so and so is over there it's like oh i don't i don't know you know la is a big place you can't learn that shit let me tell you from five years till i got there that's when i started making records so most of my life was spent in school on the basketball court or in the studio mm -hmm. be before I made records. So I wasn't out, you know, hitting corners and, you know, all that type of shit. I was a fucking teenager, you know. Now, um, did, did Quick's beef with uh, MC8 ever affect you? No, we no. know them dudes. Good, no. good. Okay. No, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I remember what it was. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, to, between them two dudes, I guess it was serious, uh, as a heart attack, but I was cool with Chill, you know, he was from CMW, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of dudes, man. It's like, I don't think it got to that point because they didn't have nothing but words. You know what I mean? It wasn't like these niggas was fighting each other at a 
concert or some shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was more it was more tension that the public bought into because back then what you heard escalated. And then somebody else say something. Then that escalates. And then by the time you by the time it was over, it was huge, but I don't even think them two dudes even had a problem with each other. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it wasn't all this information. It wasn't like they was Twitter beefing or you know what I mean? Like you couldn't see it. You just heard about it. So you mm -hmm. thought it was bigger than it was. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like it's gonna be a shootout at a concert and shit like that. I don't I don't think it ever escalated to that level. It just might have been some you know, I, I can't. I can't even remember what the fuck it started from. It was like some dishes on songs. It was. Like it was that. the red tape, uh, yeah. and Quick did a slide. Yeah, but I, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, like, like back then, even when we were making them records, I, I told KK Richie because I listened to all them songs. I said, "Hey, man, you know, the game making all these songs." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I didn't know. I was just writing my rap and said, "You got your sixteen? You know what I mean? Shit like that." Yeah, I'm gonna get on it. But I'm saying they sneaking in little shit that I didn't know nothing about. Just, just from, just from that standpoint, I'm not a gangbanger. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying nothing wrong with, it, but it's like I didn't know what the fuck they was talking about when they was talking about the trees or this <laughs> and this and that. You know. <laughs> now, um, I, I want to jump away from hip hop just for a bit. In the meantime, don't go near this area, South Central Los Angeles, at Florence and Normandy, because there is still. No police presence there, and a lot of people trying to get through that intersection have been assaulted with rocks and bottles and sticks. What, what do you remember about the L.A. riots? Mm. I remember I was in the studio on um, Santa Monica Boulevard. I was in Westlake, studio called Westlake. That's where Michael Jackson recorded Thriller and all that shit. It was one of our home studios. And I remember the whole city... I tell you, we was working on a song. We was there about two, two, three in the morning, and the whole city was smoke filled. Um, right out in front of the studio, a dude crashed into a light pole, uh, being chased by the cops from Beverly Hills. He like robbed a jewelry store or some shit. So we sitting there, and it's me and two of my guys and an engineer, little white dude engineer, and we watching on TV like this is fucked up. Like we got to go home and this shit. You know what I mean? Like I had to drive back to <laughs> England. They had to drive back to this shit, and the whole city's in pandemonium. Shit on fire, everything burning. I'm serious. It's smoke. I must have been maybe fifteen to twenty miles an hour all the way home, like going straight down the Brea all the way back to Eaglewood. And um, you know, I think the next day or two, Vibe magazine called and. uh because they had burned down uh, one of our main record stores called The Warehouse, which was on the Brea, like in uh, Rodeo. Rodeo, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and Easy um, met over there with the publicist Phyllis Pollock. She's the lady that broke the fuck the police uh, FBI letter. Mm -hmm. She worked for Rufus. I was, she was part of my publicity, and she was ace publicity. And... Um, you know, we did an interview with Vibe and talked about it and all that stuff. But just to see the city in ruins and to see all the, you know, you know, everybody was still, you know, they tried to blame it on the niggas, but everybody was still, mm, everybody, yeah. you know. <laughs> we've seen it, you know. Um, i seen I seen niggas with, with didn't even have their own house with couches and TVs. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was crazy to just witness it. I can be a little picky, blame the sticky icky, pick a bottle, get a glass, down the sippy sippy. Let's fast forward a little bit. Um, the Fixers Project, w whatever happened with that? It's on sale on iTunes. It's, it's been on sale. It's been on iTunes for 10 years. Okay. Everybody goes, everybody goes, where after the Fixers? I say it's on iTunes. Okay. Um, what, what, what do you mean what happened? No, no, that's, I thought that, that there was some, some like shady business deal that it was never released or something no, like that. No, was, it, was, it wasn't a shady business deal. It was a, a managerial issue and conflict within the organization based on one individual that had a short sightedness with, with the uh, success of what we were trying to do. Um, and as far as uh, frustration goes, you know, Quick got a family to support. He got kids. Mm -hmm. So he was like, man, I'm just going to go and do my own thing because once the dude leaked the record. See, he leaked the record. Ah, that's what it was. On, on uh, MySpace, I'm like, why would you do that? Uh, man, I don't think this. You know, we, we had we had an issue because Interscope put out the single, but they wouldn't come up with a, the, the money we wanted to do the album. And I was just like, fuck it, we'll just 
take what we can get and get the album out. We're like, we don't want to fuck the momentum up of the record. And then by that time, all the all the shit had started getting dissolving and motherfuckers had attitudes and shit. Mm. And I was left I was left in the rubble. And I think I, I read some things online sometimes when I see the record out. And people, they, they have it all wrong because they, they read the quick interviews and they think he's talking about me. He's talking about the other guy. Mm, okay. You know, they talking about me and talking about I'm high down in St. Louis. It's like, that's, that's not me. That was another gentleman. Okay. But, um, to, 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 you know, I wanted, I just wanted the fans to have it. So I, I, you know, hooked it up, got the cover done and all that shit. Just put it online. So hopefully people will pick it up if they want it. Shit, we're, we're, down, um, we're picking it up right now as we speak. My boy's typing it in. I, I didn't even know that. So yeah. It's, it's been, I've had it on iTunes for 10 years. Man. I just, I just, I just never promoted it because it was just too much funk going on. And, you know, and, 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 and you know, my, my thing was, I told Q, it was like, man, um, we kind of could have saved it and fixed it in a sense. You know, mm-hmm. we call ourselves the fixers. We could have fixed it, but, mm-hmm. you know, everybody was going through their own issues and shit, and he decided to go off and just be DJ quick again. And I ain't mad at him about that, because everybody's just trying to make money. That's all we, we did the project to make money, and ultimately we started the project to be a production company. Okay. So I said, I said if we sell them a sound, they'll come to us. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, we was pitching beats and shit, and, you know, we weren't getting too many bites. And I was like, fuck it, let's just make a record, and we'll sell that sound, and then they'll come to us, and we'll get more work. We got a little work with this and shit with some people. And, um, but it just didn't last, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's a, lot of, a lot of ego yeah. sometimes, a lot of, lot, of, lot of shit going on, man, especially yeah, there, nowadays. There, there's a handful of songs that I call the perfect hip-hop song, and... Can you work with that? Is the perfect hip hop song. I mean, it just sounded like you guys were in a good, had a good vibe going. The hook is beautiful. Worldwide AM hitting me on my Gmail. I mean, you were you you guys were nuts with it, man. Can how that how that come about that song? Well, I created it. I made that record. Beautiful um, fucking song. Well, you know. No, I, I, see, <laughs> Dog, I, I see. I see people. I see people, and they go. They hear the song. They go, DJ Quick. I'm like, yeah, I'm on it too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the DJ Quick. I said, no, the first person rapping is me. Oh, okay. You know, Quick got this. He got he got like them stands. You know, everything is like DJ Quick, DJ Quick. People would come up to him and be like, Quick, man, you brought it back with the West, man. Can you work with that? Uh-huh. And then he'd be like, what? 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 Well, AMG produced it. And then they'd be like, oh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It wasn't that. It was like, oh, he did it. Like oh, we thought you did. So, um. Uh, no, I, I, we, we were we were trying to come up with something. I knew I wanted something that was young, got people on the dance floor, yeah. brought, brought, go bring the girls out to the club for the performances and stuff. And we had did a few songs before then, and I kept telling them every time, like, because we had a setup where he got his equipment on one side, got my equipment on one side. You know, when when I'm banging something out, he in the headphones. When, he, when, when, when I'm in the headphones, he banging this stuff out. So... Um, you know, I was like, dude, I got it. I got, I think I got it. You know, so every time we take a break, I'm like, check it out, listen to it. So he listen to it, be like, ah, oh, it's cool. You know, you know, you know. So I just started writing. So I wrote my verse. Um, and it took me a couple of days to come up with a hook because I wanted something that's gonna be simple, catchy, repetitive, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. You know. So um, yeah, that's the perfect, uh, perfect talk song. I talked him. Thank you. I talked him into. Uh, I was like, why don't you just cut it? Why don't you cut it? You know. So we cut it. And after he heard it, we listened to it and heard the hook, and she's like, oh, okay. He's like, I don't know what to say. I was like, I'll I kick you off, man. So I was scribbling up some lines and make, grab a line or two, you know, spark your brain and say, okay, let me go with this. So he wrote his shit and cut it. And he was like, I don't want to sound like Young Jeezy. And I was like, no, nigga, I need you to sound like DJ Quicko. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, but we cut it. You know, we put the girl in the intro speaking Portuguese and shit. I still don't know what she's saying. But uh, it turned into a little ditty, and we took it to the radio. We took it to Julio G, and he banged that bitch out like 10 times in a row and blew the horn and whistles and all that. So we was like, okay, we got something. There it is right you know, there. We, hmm. Yeah, we, we we started off, and shouts out always to Julio G for breaking that record for us because very important. Back when, you know, when K-Day came back with him, especially, D, you know, being, being an uh, on-air personality, and the DJ and breaking that record for us, which led to us getting the deal with Interscope, which led to getting us on MTV again, which led to old records selling again and getting all that work. And we worked our ass off, you know, doing that record. I haven't worked that hard ever in my life to promote a record. 
Mm. You know, because it's a, it's a million different outlets now. Back in the day, you do like five, six magazines, a couple TV shows. Yeah. That was it. You know, we did a lot of work to support that shit. And the people responded. And I, I always, I'm always going to appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. No so, matter how no matter how it ended up, shit, I, I I got another little hit out at 37 years old. One more question, and then I'm gonna let you go. We can't this interview wouldn't be complete without uh, talking about Sugar Free to Pimp. Uh, explain to us um, in your eyes how Sugar Free came into the picture. Uh, Sugar Free came through uh, Black Tones label, um, and I wasn't around when they cut those the, the first album. Um, but I heard it, you know, I, I think quick slid us a that tape or whatever. And I was just like, wow. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like future, futuristic shit. And yes. I was like, well, I guess I ain't the pimp no more. Cause you got a real one up in this motherfucker. <laughs> this nigga popping them peas and shit. So I think I met him when we were doing, uh, rhythm, rhythmalism. And, you know, by that time he was about to come out like 96 or 90, now he came out 96. So, you know, like that, yeah. Like a fan, you know, everybody fans, you know, he put Player Ham on the first single. But they had they had did a couple of records on Brother Melism too, but we just all jailed, man, because you know, once you once you join our crew, once you accept it, you meet everybody and everybody loves your shit. We was all fans of each other anyway, so and that and that's the most important thing about my crew is like we're all fans of each other. Like forever in a day. Mm-hmm. It's like no nobody's nobody's, you know, the the quick's a fan of mine, I'm a fan of high seas, second and none a fan of High seeds and sugar free, like we're all fans of each other. I, we we just did a show recently out in Arizona. And we had a little studio set up in the hotel, and you know, motherfuckers in there smoking, smoking and drinking and talking shit and hanging out. So in the next room, they got the you know, they in there cutting songs and free, and they losing his mind on some shit. I was just like, I go in there to listen. I was like, this dude, he 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 he's got the the, the magnetism yes. of a million of a million minds. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a good story. When we did, um, when we did, uh, down, 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 we did down, down, yeah. down at Quick's house out in the Valley. And it was one of them days where it was so damn hot and the damn AC broke. So we got a big fan blowing, um, blowing the hot air out the house. Right. Cause we can't cut the fan on and cut the vocals at the same time. We're like in a liver. Right. So sugar freak going to do his shit. And I was just like, Hey man. I said, this nigga's killing these one-liners and shit. He's like, man, I got to do my shit over. Like, hey, niggas was rewriting shit and all kind of shit after that nigga did his part. I was like, man, this dude over here killing this motherfucker. He's talking about sliding off into a pool of pimp And when you do, you shut the fuck up. <laughs> Damn, man. Yeah. It was just, it's just as magical that day making it. And we was listening to that shit going like, oh, yeah. He said, bitch, you'd have better luck trying to find a Tupac than to find an ice cream yeah. truck or some shit. I'm like, Jesus he, Christ. He did, he said to me, buying something off, buying you something off, off the, the ice cream, cream truck. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But man. he, but but he, but he, see, free. He's 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 just like that all the time. And he's a gang of fun. And you know, when we all when we all hang out and see each other, it's all to the plus. And you know, everybody got their own little crews, and we all jail and do our shit. It ain't never no problems, man. Because we we so happy to be here still doing this type of stuff and getting the response. And it seems like as the years go by, because the last show we did, that shit was incredible. And it's like, wow, everybody's just getting better and better. It ain't like niggas falling off. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Damn. Getting better and better. That's what's up, man. So that, that, that's, that's God working for us. And, uh, you know, all our supporters, you know, I don't want to call them fans, but all our supporters yeah. and people that supported all of us through the years. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Always appreciative yeah. and, and, and would do, do anything for it. Appreciate that. Well, we thank you so much for your contribution to hip hop. And um, thank you. Yeah, AMG, where can we find you? Oh man, I just got back on Instagram. I'm I'm at the AMG show. There it is, the AMG show. That's nice it. and easy. I love that. I love that, man. Thank you so much once again, um, AMG. You have a great night, and it was a pleasure, man. It was definitely a pleasure. Likewise, Arnold. Cool. I appreciate you, I'll, man. I'll talk to you soon, homeboy. Peace, man. For sure. Right, peace.